beneath the stars so bright. Pull your hat down, make sure your cinch is tight. Horses kinda snuffy, cold chill up your spine. They'll get your ass moving, sun will burn on daylight. Kinley and we're burning daylight. Welcome to Burning Daylight, the only podcast for the working cowboy. Well, howdy there, daylight burners. Happy Monday. Hope your weekend treated you good. Um, yeah, I uh, I had a good weekend. Can't complain too much. It's it wasn't warm, but we had uh, we had some sunny weather and uh, and, sh- and uh, shit's kind of starting to dry out. So that's that's helpful. It's uh, it I don't know makes it makes uh makes a guy in a better mood when when the weather's nice. You know, just uh, it just helps out a little bit. Everybody has a seems to have a little bit better. Outlook on life when when the sun's shining. So, anyways, I've been uh, I've been thinking about this this series that I want to do for a while, and, and the good thing is uh, I can go as as deep into it as I want, um, and and it could be a long long series, but I don't think it needs to be. I <laughs> I'm gonna cover couple different periods of it but um all in all i think the the main the main point i want to get across on this look at the the history of the meat packing industry in the u.s is uh america was truly built on on beef and (coughs) it was uh like some of our biggest cities and uh and and it also uh, kind of gives you a little window into the future uh, of some of the some of these meat packing towns that uh, they're kind of little podunk, no nowhere towns. But if you look at at the the traditional meat packing centers of of the United States, they all kind of started as little podunk, uh, nowhere towns, and uh, turns out that people just really like beef. It's uh, it's a good way to uh, to get good protein, but also uh, from an economic uh, and efficiency standpoint. How uh, in a time of war, the the beef cattle provides you with the most amount of meat. <coughs> then then um, well, yeah, there's buffalo and whatnot. They they there's one I. I'd, Maybe I'll uh, I'll look into that during during this uh, this whole process and when we, we move forward into a different episode in the series. But it makes you wonder why they they eh, I, I don't know um, the buffalo buffalo also has a lot of meat uh, compared to the to the relative relative size. They're they're big animals uh, a cow and a buffalo uh, a cow in particular, but they also have a, a, like a ton of muscle on them. There, there's a lot of meat on, on a beef cow, and and a buffalo's not not too uh, different from that. I, I I would imagine. I I don't know what the yield you get on your average bison carcass, but um, anyhow. So if you look at some of these um, some of these different centers throughout uh, history, they they kind of sprang up because they were providing meat to a war effort. And <coughs> and, and actually kind of most of them in, uh, in the 1800s and the early 1900s. And then um, technology changed and, and it, uh, it kind of kind of decentralized the, well, uh, not even decentralized it. It, it, it moved them to a different, centralized location but uh the story of the meatpacking industry has always been one of uh monopolization and started out as a bunch of whole different um you know smaller different entities and then 
they eventually consolidated into <coughs> into these these giant conglomerates, which we we see now, and um, and what we saw in the in the late eighteen hundreds when when we finally when when the first uh, antitrust type uh, legislation went through to to break up monopolies and the meat packing industry was one of the was only one leg of that deal. I mean, there was the oil, there was the mining. Um, there, there's any number I- during the, the Gilded Age that that produced these uh, type of monopolies, but the meat packing industry kind of, you know, it hits near and dear because uh, we raise the animals that that go through it. <coughs> but we we get. We're pretty disconnected here, here in the rural world, and and for I guess for good reason. You know, we're wh- when you when you grow food for others, you typically have um, a pretty close relationship with uh, the whole circle of life. You you uh, you raise your plants your, and your animals to be consumed by <coughs> by other animals, and and. A lot of times that meant you you know you butchered out your own uh, your own animals you 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 sl- or you slaughtered your own animals you butchered your own meat to to get by and then the the excess you know whether it, whether it be animals or, or meat whatever you you sold and that that's kind of how you made your living but you you provided for your family first with uh, with, with your crops whether whether it be uh, livestock or, or <coughs> or a plant, you know, wheat, uh, produce, whatever it is. But you're you're very keenly aware of where your food comes from and how 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 to get it and what the the work that goes into it. Um, you know, you're very in touch with that. And then when you sell that off, there there becomes a little bit of a disconnect from from the producer to the buyer and. The buyer needs knows they need it. They need food, but they a lot of times they don't understand what goes on, and uh, and a lot of times they don't. <coughs> I feel like well, most of us here in in the agricultural world feel like they don't have the the correct amount of respect for what goes into putting that on their plate, and I and I agree with that a lot, but. Who's to blame for that? That's a that's a story, and an argument for a different day. But there's uh, and and this is just going from kind of a oh, about a what I've been at it about two hours, a little over two hours of of looking in into the the history of the meat packing industry and just this you know considered an intro episode, um, <coughs> but there's there's a pretty clear pattern. Of of how these these packing industries come about. First of all, it comes from influx of population. So, in order for the meat packing inter- industry to thrive, and, and not just be you know a bunch of people butchering their own beef or you know like small small like community based uh, slaughterhouses, there has to be another industry. That uh, <coughs> unless, um, well, e- even so, there has to be another industry driving this huge demand for, for beef in particular. This is uh, you know, I'm gonna, uh, we'll we'll, we'll kind of throw pork in there. Um, poultry is uh, is a whole different animal in and of itself. That could be a whole, a whole different series. Uh, apart from the, yeah, we'll even get into the to the lamb a little bit, but. Uh, the two big ones are pork and, and beef. That's uh, and throughout the the history of it, it started, you know, 1662, I believe, was the first one. Oh, what was that fella's name? William Pinchon, P Y N C H O N, Pinchon, Pinchon. Uh, he's a, he's a he's a Brit, so it wouldn't be Pinchon. It'd be Pinchon. Um, I guess he died in in 1662. 
but he essentially was is kind of credited with the the godfather, if you will, of of the American meatpacking industry. Um, he was a fur trader and just an overall kind of entrepreneur business had a had a sense for business. And he he was credited with uh, kind of the founder godfather of the American meatpacking industry when he started processing a bunch of pigs and salting them and smoking them and and exporting it to the to the West Indies, so the Caribbean area, to be to be used down on those sugar plantations and whatnot, and. And that all uh, that all happened at Springfield, Massachusetts. A and let's see, he he was he was born in 1590, and he was uh, died in 1662, so he was 72 years old. Uh, I would imagine the bulk of his his deal was in like that 1620 area, 1620 to probably 1640, because it said he he retired to England at some point, a wealthy man. 1640, I guess, is uh, is when Springfield was officially renamed. Uh, so he was right on the edge of Massachusetts and Connecticut. I'm not sure how that works in the map. Those those states are like this big. Uh, I guess they were big land masses at the time, but um, yeah, there. I, I think my my home county, Baca County maybe has 5,000 people in it, maybe. Um, it's uh, roughly the size, just the county is the size of the state of Connecticut. So he uh, he had settled and, and made this uh, this little trading post on the, on the edge of Massachusetts and Connecticut. And it's funny is because of uh, the laws in and, and how they they did their economics in Massachusetts Bay Colony that's he uh, he eventually annexed his his land into the Massachusetts Bay as opposed to the Connecticut Colony it was and it was because it was a more of a free market approach in the Massachusetts Bay so um, one of the earlier um, earliest accounts of like a, a guy just voting with his feet here in, in America it's like nah it's the the great part about America is like if you don't like how y this particular state does something, there's a lot of other places to choose from, and you can just pick up and go. Um, the the amount of of wealth you have before you leave kind of plays a big factor into where you go, and, and how how successful you'll be when you get there. But the fact remains is like. If you have the will, you can just up and go somewhere. And back then, where you could just like, ah, we're not part of you anymore. Fuck you, Connecticut. We're part of Massachusetts Bay Colony now. And and a lot of that had to do with with how how the economics ran. But anyway, he <coughs> he set up um, one of the one of the or I guess the first meatpacking. Um, firm in in the United States where like he that was their business and and they exported a bunch of salt pork to to the West Indies and then you uh you fast forward to the time of the revolution and uh let's see let me find that and Boston Boston and, and then later Philadelphia became <coughs> kind of the the hub of the the meat packing industry in the, in the United States in the colonies at the time, but uh, Brighton Cattle Market uh, was was in Boston, founded in mid 1776. So you you could honestly say that beef is more American than apple pie. I don't I don't ever recall hearing about an apple pie market in Boston, but. Brighton Cattle Market was founded in mid 1776 when John Jonathan Winship uh, first and second father and son put out a call to the farmers of Middlesex County urging them to slaughter their cattle 
and send them the resu- uh, resulting meat supply to the village of Little Cambridge, um, later named Brighton, to help provision General Washington's soldiers. So when I was, I mentioned it briefly before, but some of the biggest booms in the meatpacking industry came around war because <coughs> fighting is is the ultimate thing that you do. Uh, that's what brings an end to to a war is is the is the fight. But in order to keep up the fight, you have to feed an army, and most of the the men that comprise your army are guys that would normally be out there raising the food, processing the food, shipping the food, the Teamsters, all, all of that, your truck drivers, just your skilled, your, your average like laborer is who gets thrown into the army when, when war comes about. Uh, <coughs> and because of that, you, you, you have to find a way to feed them. And, and, one of the ways that America has has been able to build their you know status as a world power is not just be being the one of the most powerful or the now the most powerful military in the world uh, not not even close second but uh, there for a while we were one of the the premier military powers in the world but also like we were one of the premier agriculture countries in the world we still are but less and less of a focus is being uh, put on that but it was not only our weapons and men that helped uh, turn the tide of world war one but it was also the the fact that we were able to supply food to to these countries that were fighting world war one while (coughs) you know while we were (coughs) we were sitting back we were we were making all the shit for them to to win but also we were feeding their army and that that's the if you don't if you don't have food for your army you don't have an army eventually that that army just falls in on itself and they desert or they just they starve to death and so and it's it's one of the reasons why <laughs> why the north was able to win the civil war we'll, we'll get into that uh, a little bit later but here we we'll go back to to Brighton cattle industry. So this is the Brighton cattle market. Um, so British had just a- evacuated wa- uh, Boston and the Army of New England, which was then headquartered in and around the Liberty Aid City, was in desperate need of provisions of all kind. The Winship family, who held a contract from the U.S. government to supply meat for the Army, soon realized that there's more money to be made from doing the slaughtering themselves, uh, which, of course, necessitated the establishment of a local slaughterhouse. So you got you got all these fighting men, they're they're fighting their ass off. They've just uh, liberated Boston. And if I remember right, that Boston gets recaptured later on, but <coughs> they gotta find a way to feed these. So like they ju- they just uh kick the British out of the city, but they can only hold it as long as uh the, the army holds up and for the army to hold up, they got to be well fed, or at least decently enough fed, to to keep fighting. Uh, the cattle and slaughtering trades launched in 1776 quickly reformed the the sleepy agricultural village of Little Cambridge into a thriving commercial center. The selling and butchering of cattle became the economic mainstay of the town for more than a century, uh, providing. Uh, imp- uh, profoundly influencing virtually every s- aspect of Brighton's social, political, and uh, economic, political, and social development. Um, and that—that's the—that's kind of the the pattern throughout. If you look at all um, all of these these packets, so Cincinnati, one one that maybe you don't think of quite as much, but it used to be called Porkopolis because uh, they. F- they were right on the Ohio River, um, and they had access into New England and the Appalachian region. They had good farm ground, and they had a lot of hogs. And then they set up these plants there, and it was, you know, at the, I guess, kind of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And things started to speed up. Like, the more technology increased, I mean, you like, 
they they always give um Eli Whitney the the credit for kind of spurring the industrial revolution here in in the United States and that's that's a fair fair assessment but i i really think that the the packing meat packing industry doesn't get enough credit and as as a cowboy you know aspiring rancher and uh and whatnot i i understand how how nasty the meat packing business is and like they're they're not great people um and i don't know if they ever have been but when you when you come when you just sit back and look at it it's uh it, it's a really impressive deal what they've been able to do what we've been able to do here in the united states with uh <coughs> with, with uh the 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 production of meat and, and it's all spurred from a strong meat packing industry so without the meat packing industry that we have uh that you know that has grown to what it is today we don't have the cattle industry that that has grown to what it is today it's a very symbiotic re uh, relationship and and with that like there's there's a lot of competing interests and and we see that over the years and and essentially and and as much as bill bullard didn't want to admit it these trade associations are essentially unions uh where you you don't have you know factory employees as members but you have ranchers as as members uh and so even though they may have a, a, a different legal distinction and, and what they can do, essentially the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, RCAF, U.S. Cattlemen's Association, they're essentially different unions for the rancher. Um, and, and, and it's really, really funny uh, and, and interesting how all those, all those different characters intertwine. And, but... At the end of the day, it's a very, very symbiotic relationship. Uh, without the without the rancher, the packer's not in business. Um, that could be changing with the with the advent of this uh, lab grown meat shit. Who knows? That, but in the meantime, without the cattle, there is no packer. Also, without the packer, the cattle uh, don't have anywhere to go. <coughs> and and so. Like both sides have have to rely on, upon each other, and it's once you get into that industrialized um, model where where like you're 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 operating at scale, it's a uh, it's a lot harder for like your average worker to have any power and and your average rancher to have any power. Like w once you sell those cattle, like you don't have any control of what happens to them after that, unless you, unless you have it in in your contract, you just you don't you don't have much say, you know, and and that's where the, the trade associations come in. That's where the the labor unions come in, and there's there's a very rich history of all of all of the labor movement and uh, <coughs> and the war, you know, with the range wars, and, and all the way now to where the we're, we're kind of. We're kind of at the same point in the in the economic standpoint. We're like we're we're kind of in the same situation as they were back in the the like late 1800s, early 1900s with the, the big four packers. Now we or big five. Now we got big four, and it, it's just it's funny and interesting to to just follow the follow the path of this whole this whole combined industry and and when you compare that with uh with the different other industries i think the one that really comes closest to mirroring uh being a mirror image or like not 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 mirror image but like uh being the the most similar is is the energy industry uh because it's <coughs> it, it's uh it, it's kind of a life and life and death death type deal eventually it's uh whoever controls the food whoever controls the industry they they control the people that's 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 how that, that's how it pans out and whether there's a sinister sinister plot uh at the top of it um it's kind of it's a compelling argument to think that there is but whether that's true or not it 
that's how it, how it plays out. If if you don't if you don't have energy and you don't have food, you don't have much going for you. So it's uh, and, and it's funny how the the rise and fall of all these urban centers. A lot of them are not just uh, you know it. There there's a lot of factors that that go into play with the location. And like waterways, roads, whatever, uh, ports. But <coughs> for whatever reason, it made them a good place of of, of business. They they were kind of built on the back of of beef cattle, like, and some to to a lesser extent pork, um, and and regional variety for sure. The New England states were were a lot more known for their cattle than the southern states where they were known for pork. And then the the western states were, were built on, on the beef cow, which was driven by demand from from the northeastern states. <coughs> and it all it all it was all kind of built on the back of, of the beef cow. And um, if you if you look like there's a meat packing district in in most of your major cities, but like New York is a uh, is a this huge shining example, and uh, I didn't look uh, look up too much in the in San Francisco, but I bet it's it's kind of right along the same same lines. But New New York is a uh, is a place known for importing and exporting a lot of stuff. They're right there on the coast. Uh, they're they're known to be a center of commerce, but also New York State's been is known for agriculture, um, not. Like if you're not from there in the New England area, I guess you probably don't know as much about it. Uh, I know I didn't, but yeah, uh, once you get outside of New York City and uh, and then you know you get your your main urban areas in within New York, you know, Albany and Buffalo and whatnot, and they're they're industrial towns, but the rest of the state is agriculture, uh, and that that goes uh, goes to say for for most of every other state in the country there's uh even even the little bitty states like uh like new jersey new uh massachusetts um i don't know so much about connecticut i think they're mostly urban but i i would bet you once you get off the beaten path a little bit there's there's some some farm country and in, in, even in connecticut and so like all these all these states have their have their urban areas and then they have uh everything else that supplies the urban area even even going way back when so new york was uh was the obvious place to to ship all your stuff out being on the coast and also at the you know you had the east river and the hudson river and i think there's another one there i'm not for sure but uh, but at least those the the two big rivers as well as the atlantic ocean like it's a it's a perfect place to uh, to, to buy, sell, and trade shit. And you had this whole area of New York City that it was always known as a trading post, but as, <coughs> and I think New York more so in during the Civil War as opposed to Boston during the Revolutionary War, um, New York became um, kind of a meatpacking hub because they're supplying food to the, tr the, the Union troops during the Civil War. And at one point, the meatpacking district, and it's uh, it's only I don't know a handful of city blocks. I, I forget exactly what the the distance is, but there was 250 meatpacking plants uh, and slaughterhouses all in this little area. And the funny thing about uh, the meatpacking industry is it uh, it's not very glamorous. And uh, as we get further into this this series will uh will delve into like the jungle by upton sinclair and uh and some of the just like heinous conditions that that used to be in these these early meat packing and meat packing plants and even even through today like if you if you uh if you follow some headlines especially here here recently like there's been several headlines of these uh these contractor companies that that come in and uh, and clean the plants employing some very very young people like uh, sometimes young as like 12 years old which 
I don't necessarily have a problem with, but if, if I was sending my kid to go wash out one of these these huge packing plants in, in say, Garden City or Amarillo or, or Greeley, wherever, if I was to allow my kid to go get a job doing that, like, man, I, I would, uh, I'd be locked up for, for child labor laws. But if you just import them from Guatemala and, uh, and they don't technically work for the packing plant themselves, they're contract, uh, contract labor. Well, maybe they, you know, people turn a, a blind eye. And so there's been several instances of that, but that's always been the case, uh, throughout the history of this country is the the people that by and large the people that work at these these packing plants are low skilled immigrant labor like first generation um you know back in the day it was irish and italian and german and scandinavian uh immigrants and then that later uh translated to the black uh <coughs> and then they weren't necessarily immigrants but they were migrants moving from the south into the the midwest and the in the north to these these uh industrial cities and then uh from there it went from like mexico guatemala honduras and then um like garden city kansas got a a pretty strong vietnamese population because they they came over to work in the packing plants and now if you live in one of the in or near one of these packing towns there's a lot of somalian immigrants uh <laughs> and it's all um and all all these people typically come from kind of war torn areas like back in the in the day there was there was war throughout all the papal states which is now uh Italy um Prussia and France and England and Germany which well Prussia has essentially became Germany uh all throughout the 1800s constant warfare through there and led to a lot of refugees uh russia you know russia and german have always had a, like a disputed border uh, not so much in the in the 20th century which well uh, we'll see here see here soon um also part of the reason i i bring this up because there's a there's a big war looming on the horizon and man we we don't know what like government intervention is just quite yet we got a I got a little taste of it with uh with covid but when you go into like world war ii and when you go into war rationings and uh it damn near that with you know the war the the depression the dust bowl all all of that compounded like it almost broke the beef industry in the in the u.s and it it damn near did break the the sheep industry um particularly we sent so much uh, mutton over to the troops in Europe and and uh, and the Pacific during World War II that the the fighting men just got tired of eating the shit and uh, and a lot of them came home and they they never ate another bite of lamb in their life and uh and that had a hu huge profound impact on on the the sheep industry here in the United States and and all of, all of it's all intertwined and and then, then you you add the like the immigrant labor particularly coming over from Europe back in the day like uh you know marxism and socialism it all spawned in germany um uh, <coughs> but it spread throughout europe and with with good reason when you when you look at the the working conditions back back in those days it was uh it was not hard to see why your average uh, factory worker, um, meat pack and plant worker, uh, steel mill worker, um, wh whatever, in in s wherever you worked in these industrial uh, in environments, um, you were routinely taken advantage of. Um, you look at the like the the company towns in in the coal mining um sector just <coughs> the the company owned anything and everything and you didn't even get paid in real money you got paid in company script which only could be used at the company store and to pay your rent for the company house that you lived in and uh to pay the tuition at the company school that your kids went to and 
Yeah, and then if you if you even thought about um, asking for better conditions, they just fired you. And um, when they fired you, they kicked you out of your house. They uh, they took all the all the company owned stuff. And by the way, you were in the middle of fucking West Virginia, and it was like a three days walk to the nearest city. So good luck, and uh, think about that next time you want to speak up. And so it was not real hard to see why socialism, Marxism, uh, really took hold in in Europe, and then then later in these, not even not even just the urban centers, but like uh, like we said, West Virginia, um, all throughout the the Rust Belt of of the Appalachian region, and, and the these packing towns uh, throughout the Midwest. It was uh, <coughs> it was. Uh, it was it was just I guess a continuation of the the old class struggle, but uh, with with little different circumstances. Instead of uh, you know lords and serfs and and uh, and kings and whatnot, you had the government, but you had you had the the giant companies. Uh, I don't know at the time that if they were uh, they weren't they weren't necessarily cor- necessarily corporations, but they were considered they were organized as trusts. Um, and it vertically integrated the industry, you know, like the, like the, the railroad industry, the, the steamer, steam line in, uh, industry, um, packing plan industry. And then the, the more technology, uh, grew and, and the more these, these companies became intertwined with government, like the more and more. <coughs> you had the the growth of these monopolies, and it, and it's happened over and over and over throughout the years. Um, but it seems like uh, it seems like maybe the packing industry is uh, one of the only one only one of those industries that keeps getting uh, put at the forefront of it over and over again. But it's one of those things that it's one of those industries that. No matter how much it changes and technology increases, people still have to eat, so they're always there. And, and so, like they they might they may get hit with uh, some antitrust stuff, and you know they get broke up a little bit and blah blah. But they they always come back, and uh, they they'll find uh you'll you'll find out like a war is a good way for them to to really sink their claws back in and, and uh, start building back towards, uh, you know, an oligopoly, a, mo- a monopoly, what it, whatever you want to call it, but centralizing stuff. <coughs> and, and, it, and it seems like it never fails. Uh, whenever you've got to feed a, a large amount of men that, that can't produce for themselves because they're fighting other men who can't produce for themselves uh, at the time being, um, that that's when you get a lot of you get a lot of consolidation and uh, and you see these these big like start to emerge or they they consolidate even more power and I think we're we're on the verge of that now and so it's it's kind of funny to me that Garden City Kansas may be a booming metropolis here within like the next 20 10 20 years you kn- like it's a uh, it's it's not an ideal place for a city really but it's a really ideal place for a packing plant it's uh you know you got highway 50 you got what whatever the hi- the other highway is like a big it's a big junction of hi- highway 87 um there, there's a junction there and you're not you're kind of Midway between, say, I forty and I seventy, um, you're, it's it's kind of conveniently located. So it's even though it's a little bit off the beaten path, it's not very far to to major thoroughfares, and you got a lot of cattle, and and it's already established there. If they keep building, and man, the the amount that Garden City has grown in my lifetime is is pretty tremendous like it, it's kind of a it's it's well on its way to being like a 
like a small to mid-sized city. I mean, it, I don't know how many people they have there now, but it like it just keeps growing. And you can see it, you can see it growing even more just the way the way the consolidation of the packing industry happens and it, it's uh it's a really crazy story when you when you start to to get into to all the the little details and how everything grew like from from Cincinnati well from Boston and Philadelphia being the hubs New York being another hub and then then branching out of the country move farther west and how uh <coughs> uh here I had one here uh the first cattle drive in in the u in the u s was um was in seventeen seventy nine um came all the way from texas uh in seventeen seventy six American colonists declared their independence from Great Britain when the American Revolution began. It was well known that France came to the aid of the American colonists in their fight against the British. Less well known is Spain's involvement in the American Revolution and how it led to the first Texas cattle drive. Um, Great Britain planning to them. Eager to reclaim their land and push the British out, Span Spain eventually officially joined the American Revolution in 1779. That year, the Spanish governor of Louisiana, Bernardo de Galvez, supported the Americans by sending 2,000 barrels of gunpowder and lead clothing to George Washington. He also, um, to feed the span. Okay, so he also engaged troops. Uh, he and his troops engaged the British armies in battles from Baton Rouge to the Bahamas. To feed the Spanish troops engaged in the American Revolution, Galvez asked for support from the neighboring Texas and former Texas cattle. In these letters from 1779, the commanding general of New Spain gives permission to drive 2,000 head of cattle from Texas to Louisiana. Uh, records indicate the cattle were purchased from ranches connected to missions, but there's no evidence that the cattle arrived in Louisiana. Uh, so whether the, the, the cattle drive actually happened... Um, the Spanish government still put out the order for it, and <coughs> it, it it just it's funny. Like I said, when you've got to feed a large amount of people, um, cattle's kind of the way to go to it, and and all all these all these hubs were based around feeding a new population, and and they eventually they they migrated from from the east coast to, to more the the center of the country where there was a lot a lot better ground to to grow these grow these animals and then you know get them to the railhead and then eventually like that that part didn't even come to matter because now you can take a semi way up the top of a fucking mountain and uh, as long as you got a set of corrals there or a place where you can put some portable corrals and get you can get cattle there and you can get the truck in there you can ship them right out and within you know sometime depends on how far you're going but um usually within a couple days at the maximum you can get them to 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 slaughter wherever you want to um and, and that's that or, or to the feed lot uh and and then leaving the leaving the plant, they can get them get these animals processed uh, down to where they fit in a, a in a cube of a box, and then on, on a refrigerated truck they can go anywhere. And then you know even from there you can go from the middle of the country to a port, uh, you know whether the Gulf of Mexico, the Pacific, or or the Atlantic. But you can you can drive a ship from Garden or drive a truck from Garden City, Kansas to any one of those those locations and put it in a shipping container, you know, refrigerated shipping container and ship it anywhere in the world nowadays. And that was something you couldn't do before. A and how that all has played out today is kind of it's kind of fascinating and we when you see when you see this big gear up for war, you you kind of have to look at where where the packing industry is located, and it's like Amarillo, Texas, uh, 
<coughs> Western Colorado, Eastern Kansas, Nebraska, and you, I wouldn't be surprised to see a even bigger influx of immigrant labor because who works at the packing plants? A bunch of poor immigrants. That's how, <laughs> that's how it always works, it seems like. There's, uh, I don't know, like, if, if anybody knows, uh, you know, your average white dude or, or gal that, that works at a packing plant anymore, uh, let me know, because I'm sure there's a few of you out there, but not many. It's kind of like working at a dairy. Like, if you're, if you're a white dude working at a dairy, you're probably in management somewhere. You ain't, you ain't, uh, you know, work in the milking parlor. And <coughs> there's, I don't know, I guess long story short, before there was a, another, there's another couple stories I wanted to, to highlight, but I think they, f they fit off, fit in better at a, in a later episode. But it's just, it's really, really interesting how it all plays together. And, and when you look at all the struggles between the different characters involved, whether it's the, you know, the, your assembly line worker, which it, uh, originally was called the de-assembly line, because you were taking a full carcass and de-assembling de it. Uh, that's the, the motivation for Henry Ford to create his assembly line uh, <laughs> in the motor industry, uh, you know, in the, in the automobile industry. He took his, uh, his inspiration from the packing plants and how everybody had a stationary job and you just worked on products as they came by you. So, like, if you, if your job was to, to cut this steak, you just waited until the chunk of meat came to you and then you cut it. And then the next one came and you just, and it, that was your job all day long. And, and it was a very efficient process, and he took uh, he took note of that and created the the assembly line automobile plant, which revolutionized a, a whole nother, whole different industry. And it, it just I, I guess at the end of the day, it sh it goes back to show you that <sighs> no matter how removed we get from our our food. As as a as a country and as a culture, this this whole country was built on the back of beef, and it will be for the foreseeable future. So, um, when you hear these guys talking about like these incredible prices coming up on on cattle and how low we are on numbers, like yeah, it's a concern. It is a concern, but it seems like this was a pretty good winner. So, like if you got a chance to restock, probably better do it. Um, I think, uh, I think there's, there's a chance to maybe get ahead a little bit would be these coming years because cattle prices are going to be, <coughs> going to be pretty high and I bet the demand's going to be right there because knock on wood, I hope I'm wrong, but I think we're going to war and, uh, we're going to be sending a lot of beef products over over to troops uh whether whether they're ours or, or you know another you know allied army i don't know what or or both but there's going to be demand for it and like i had spoke before on on you know investing in defense contractor stocks and uh getting jobs uh at a, at a you know at a bomb factory or whatever i think the same thing can go to say for for having some sort of job in the meat the meat cycle whether whether you're raising the animal or you're you know you're working in the plant or or some some job in in between or you know say like a leather factory you know that that used to be a huge thing where the used to just have the slaughterhouses. They they'd kill the animal and skin it, and then you then you'd send it to the butcher. Um, <coughs> and then you also had the guys that took the hides and they they, they made leather products. And then that that all kind of came became consolidated and vertically integrated. But I think anything ar around food and guns here in the next uh, probably I don't know how many years, but for the foreseeable future, that that probably be a pretty safe industry to be involved in because 
We're going to need a lot of it. Um, but anyhow, I'm going to this next episode. We'll uh, we'll cover some of the very early days, probably from the the founding uh, of the country as colonies, all the way up to say uh, civil war, and, and shortly after that'll be the next episode. And um, and then we get into the the real meat of the. Uh, of the meatpacking industry, once once the labor movement gets involved and uh, and we hit the we hit our stride in the Gilded Age, that's going to be a fun one. But um, in the meantime, that's going to take a little bit to research. Uh, I I think it is good to recognize as uh, whether you cowboy for a living, whether you raise cattle, or you just take care of them, it is a, is a good thing to note that as big of a bunch of bastards these packers are. Um, and how they're going to try to to just gut you at every chance uh, and, and get one over you. It still is a symbiotic relationship. we got to have them. they got to have us. And it's kind of it's kind of like they'll when when they they finally realized in the, the, the Cold War that the Soviet Union wasn't going anywhere and we're just going to have to learn to live together. It's kind of how I feel about the the packing industry. So, um, as much as we hate them, I don't want to run a damn packing plant. So, we got to figure out how to how, how to how to make that that relationship as good as possible. So, anyways, maybe it'll uh, maybe I'll come up with some ideas that won't amount to shit. But um, it's always good to look into this stuff and. Uh, and and I guess more than anything, learn what you don't actually know. You know, sometimes you you only know what you know, and then the more you the more you look into something, you realize how much you don't know, and then uh, then you can start looking into uh, how do you make that better. So, anyways, hope that all made sense. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Thanks again for uh, for tuning in. We had some good numbers this past week. So uh, any anybody new to the show, welcome and. Uh, Enjoy the shit show. If you're not already signed up, please go to patreon.com slash burning daylight. It's the best way to support the show. That and uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. If you got uh, if you like collagen, if you like MCT oil, and uh, they've got a bunch of other uh, supplements that are good for you, all natural stuff, good company, gives back to charity, and they also pay me pretty decent when you buy stuff. So head over there. Uh, bubsnaturals.com uh, promo code burning daylight gets you 20% off so uh, check that out and um, move your ass we're burning daylight <laughs>